Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Facing Hypocrisy podcast, episode two. So ain't nothing to it, but to get into it. You know, on the last episode of the Facing Hypocrisy podcast, we discussed and discovered China has more people who smoke than the entire population of the United States. 361,472,000 people who smoke in China versus 331,900,000 people in the United States. Well, actually, it was 335,647,099 people on October 29th, 2023. And how do we know this exact number? Well, census.gov. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, the U.S. world population clock, easily found at census.gov pop clock. You know what else the United States census tells us that America has? Destitution. Folks, destitution is poverty. Poverty that is so extreme that one lacks the means to provide for themselves. It's the state of being without money, food, a home, or even possessions of any sort. And it even threatens life unless relieved by some forms of intervention. And here's something that I learned from the U.S. Census. 50% of Americans earn less than $50,000. 11.5% of Americans, or 37 million people, live in poverty. 37,900,000 Americans are classified as living in poverty. America has so many poor people that the U.S. Census actually breaks it down and breaks down the poor using two different measures. One that's based on income alone and another that's based on income plus supplemental assistance. And this includes things like food stamps and Medicare and Social Security. Matter of fact, Social Security moved 28,900,000 elderly out of poverty. Meanwhile, the poor tax, which is otherwise known as the Earned Income Tax Credit, moved 6.4 million people out of poverty. And that's down 9.6 million from the year before. So what does it take for someone to end up in poverty? Well, how about a minimum wage job working 40 hours a week is all it takes. At 7.25 an hour, working 40 hours a week for 52 weeks a year with no days off, no vacation, no missed days of work, you will earn $15,080. Well, minus taxes, of course, because you know the government's always got to get its share, even from the poorest in this country. And with the current state of the economy, it should be quite obvious that $15,000 is not a living wage, meaning it is impossible to provide food, clothing, shelter, transportation, health care, and pay taxes, earning just minimum wage. And yet, hardly anybody ever talks about this. Why? You know, growing up, we heard that China is a communist country and, and their people suffer from extreme poverty, right? Communism's horrible. It just results in everybody being poor. And you know what? An uneducated person or somebody that just follows social media would think, man, no wonder that they have so many people who smoke. 
living in poverty, always wondering, when will I get my next meal? Where is it going to come from? Where am I going to sleep tonight? If these things are what is on the mind of a person living in poverty, it's no wonder that they slowly want to kill themselves with cigarettes. And if you're living in destitution, I hate to say it, but you know what? Lung cancer is a blessing to end the suffering of living in destitution. Living in poverty is a blessing to end the suffering sooner rather than later. Isn't it amazing how if you put yourself in somebody else's shoes and remove your understanding of the world around you to take a look at it from somebody else's perspective, how dramatically you can change your ideologies and how quickly you can come to realize we need to do something but we're obviously doing the wrong things right now. So on the last episode, all right, on the last episode, I asked, what would it take for China to institute the same measures as the UK, right? What would it take for China to give all their people who smoke the incentive to use a vape instead of slowly committing suicide by smoking combustible tobacco. And I also asked, why hasn't a single country on the entire planet eliminated smoking, or at least banned smoking? I mean, we've seen in the news constantly that there are plenty of areas that have no problem eliminating the single best way to quit smoking, but we're not gonna touch cigarettes. Oh no, matter of fact, in Australia, I even heard that they said that cigarette smoking is ingrained in the customs and traditions of the Australian people. So we're not going to do anything about cigarette smoking. We're not going to create any laws because, well, that would infringe on our customs and our beliefs and our traditions from generation to generation. But along comes the single best most easiest way to quit smoking and man that's got to be banned that's got to be taxed it's got to be made prescription only and then it's got to be regulated so that the only place you can buy the way to quit smoking is at a pharmacy when you go and buy your prescription drugs to treat your asthma emphysema and your high blood pressure and your peripheral vascular disease but if you want to go and buy a cigarette that's actually causing you to get all those diseases, you can buy that anywhere because, well, it's a generational custom. Tell me how this makes any sense anymore. Tell me that this whole world isn't revolving around constant hypocrisy. We also said, I also said, okay, why hasn't a single country on the planet banned smoking? And furthermore, why hasn't anyone created an up-to-date list of smokers globally around the world, broken down by country to show this country has the highest smoking rate, this country has the lowest smoking rate? And tobacco control is so adamant about how successful their policies are to stomp out smoking. Well, if you're so confident that your policies are so successful, why don't you create the data to prove it. They don't even have a list of countries showing where smoking is the most prominent and where it's the least prominent, let alone a list showing that, hey man, look how high the smoking rate was in this countries, and they adopted five of our 10 strategies to, you know, to eliminate cigarette smoking, to stomp out cigarette smoking. And look, they dropped in, in you know, prevalence in that country. They're not gonna give you that list because they know deep down inside that their policies don't do anything for cigarette smoking. All it does, you ready for this? All it does is make destitution more prominent across the entire globe. Higher taxes, right? Higher taxes, that'll get them to stop. They're poor people anyway, they can't afford it. They'll choose food 
over smoking. You know what? That's not how it works. Well, here we have China. Nearly one in three smokers in the world is Chinese. In 2018, there were nearly 800,000 new cases of lung cancer diagnosed in China. And every year, over a million Chinese people die from tobacco-related diseases. Tobacco control campaigns are becoming even more serious now in China. Yeah, they, they shoved some money over there, and Bloomberg set his henchmen over there to institute these policies that are going to get your people to quit smoking. But don't worry, it takes a long time for the policies to actually have the resulting effect, so you're not going to lose any more money. You know, your tobacco companies that you have, the monopoly, the Tobacco Monopoly Administration, don't worry about it. You'll still make plenty of money. But institute these policies, and you're going to make even more money because now you're going to be taxing the crap out of these poor people that are living on a fixed income. Yeah, it's going to work great. Just don't look at other countries that have done this because you're going to find out all you do is create a thriving black market. Holy cow. Fortunately... China did take care of one problem. There is one thing in China that you don't have to worry about in the rest of the world. Destitution. China declared in 2021 that it had completely stamped out extreme poverty across its entire nation. You know, there's going to be plenty of critics out there that are going to question this self-proclamation, this humongous triumph over destitution, but at least they're paying attention and doing something about the problem. They're not ignoring it like they obviously are according to the census here in the United States. And if you're watching this from another country around the globe, I hate to tell you, don't think you're so special. You think you're in the UK and oh man, we don't have that kind of problem here. That's a load of horse hockey. And we're going to show you a little clip from somebody in the UK talking about this exact situation. Because you guys have the same type of things as we have here. You guys have census and surveys that are constantly done to see how things are progressing in society. And would you be surprised to find out? Well, you're poor people. Their life sucks too. There are plenty of people all around the globe regardless of whether you're in the United States or you're in Germany or in the United Kingdom or any country around the world, except for obviously China. Look, their anti-poverty drive worked and people will at least have a meal and a roof over their head. There are 37 million people in the United States that don't know if they're gonna get a meal today or where they're gonna sleep. But we, we, we can ignore that, right? Really? What a different America out here. If I cruise up some of the haulers, you think that's a good idea? Do we think that's a good idea? Here's something that obviously you can tell, 19 million views was put out three months ago. And you wanna know why it's gotten three million views? Well, because it's the poorest region of America. This is what it really looks like. Former coal town, former coal country. The Appalachians are obviously an area of the country where destitution is prominent. And it's not because these people choose to be poor. Do you honestly think that these people are just lazy people, bums that don't do a damn thing? You quickly watch a couple of these things, you come to realize, the groovy new you know what? Wave. They've tried their damnedest. And if it wasn't for the coal mining operations that go on in town, these people wouldn't have a, a, a lick. Michael J. Deal, known as MJ, has been living here for about four years. That's where he lives. And this isn't something new. He and all the other people living in this community, it's technically a community of people that are all in the exact same situation. This is in California, Los Angeles, California. 
All these people do not have a home. They're literally living out of a tent. This community is no different than the apartment complex or any other community. Except for the fact that these people have no money, have no home, and plenty of them don't know where they're going to get their next meal from. And would you be surprised to find out there's a good fair lot of these people that have a full-time job? But because of circumstances and the way that laws are in California, they couldn't get an apartment to save their life. And like I said, this isn't a unique situation that's just here in the United States. This happens in Germany. This happens in the United Kingdom. And there's plenty of other countries that this goes on. Millions of Americans are destitute as the world's poorest. Don't believe it, right? They don't believe it. That can't possibly happen in the United States. Seriously? This can't happen in the United States? How dare you say that? When there are people that literally do not have a meal to eat, can't tell you when the last time they had a meal, and they're constantly looking for a place to spend the night because they have no home, they have no shelters nearby. Here we have a story from back when Trump was president. America's poor are becoming more destitute under Trump. Well, you know what? Biden took office, and guess what? The census shows... The problem hasn't gotten any better. If anything, the problem's actually gotten worse. So it's not about who's president. So maybe we need to pay our attention to who's in Congress and making these stupid laws that are keeping the poor poor. Heaven forbid. Why poverty persists in America. A Pulitzer Prize winning sociologist offers a new explanation for the intractable problem, intractable poverty. Yeah, well, read the article. You're gonna to come to find out there is no easy solution to this problem. Take a look at the census and you'll see that it definitely is a real problem. And you're like, why are we talking about poverty? You know, there's nothing we can re individually do about that. Well, I'm talking about this because this relates to the topic of conversation for this channel. When you're poor, you're more likely to smoke. You're more likely to die an early death. How do we know those things? Well, there's plenty of scientific studies that have done those things and have taken a look at them. And there's plenty of ways that we can track poverty over time in this country. We know that the problem hasn't gone away, right? Despite the fact that there are safeguards and institutions that give out the food stamps and give people Medicaid insurance coverage and they had Section 8 housing and I don't know what they call it nowadays because every time you get a politician comes in office, they want to change all this stuff up. They don't actually change the fundamental solution. They just give it a bunch of new names and make it sound fancy. And this is going to do this. And this is going to do this. And well, looking at the census, it hasn't done anything. Deep poverty affects millions of people. The income to poverty ratio helps to better understand how many people live near poverty, as well as the depths of poverty in the United States. The following chart uses data on the official poverty rate. Official poverty rate? So there's an unofficial poverty rate? Or more likely you don't want to talk about the fact that this arbitrary figure that they come up with for poverty is nothing but a superficial number that is being blanket applied to every single location across the entirety of the United States. Perhaps we should take a look at something Oh, I don't know, something more commonplace, like what is a living wage? Because that's the cost for a person to have adequate food, clothing, shelter, transportation, heating, electricity, you know, all the basic fundamental things that we take for granted when we are living well in society. 
this is the standard that America should be using, not some arbitrary minimum wage. If you make minimum wage 40 hours a week, guess what? Technically, you're just above the poverty limit. How do we know? Well, because, well, the government's going to give you a beautiful chart. Here's the beautiful chart I was just talking about. Look, one person weighted average threshold is $14,880. If you're under 65, that goes $15,230. If you're over 65, well, then we're, we're going to make it even tougher on you. You need to make less than $14,040 to be considered poverty, right? Seriously? Now we've got to segregate out the elderly from the rest of the population because, well, the elderly can survive on less money than a younger person that's living in poverty. Who came up with that ridiculous idea? And how are we going to make people's lives better when we just arbitrary classify them as this? And can actually the, the measures that the government does make people's lives better? Well, if you simply take a look, deep poverty affects millions, right? Well, during the COVID-19 outbreak, guess what they did? They decided that, you know what, to make things simple and easy, we're going to now take 200% of the poverty limit and anybody that makes less than 200% of the poverty limit, you are now eligible for all of the things that we do to eliminate poverty. We're gonna give you a, a monthly allotment of food stamps based upon your income. So if you're making 200% of poverty, well, you're probably gonna get 20 bucks a month. Maybe you get you, you know, a gallon of milk a week, all right? And if you're living near the 100% of the poverty line, then you will, we'll give you, you know, 250 bucks a month for you to go buy your groceries and and to live and get you out of poverty. They're not gonna give you all the food that you need to survive, just enough to get you out of poverty. Cause that's all we really worry about in this country. We don't actually wanna make sure that you're well fed and you can afford, oh, I don't know, a $12 salad instead of a $1 cheeseburger on the value menu. No, we're, we're not worried about healthy choices. We're only worried about making sure that you don't starve to death. Matter of fact, that's the advantage of the wonderful calorie dense, nutrient deficient, cheap food we have in this country. You're certainly not going to look like you're starving to death, despite the fact that your body's diseases and illnesses and injuries and your frequency to become injured is so much more than the person that's eating a nutritionally dense healthy diet, but we're not going to talk about that either. You can figure that out on your own if you decide to get an education and actually look into things that, well, nobody else wants to look at because it's an ugly truth to reveal the hypocrisy in this country. So what do they do? 200% of the poverty limit was what was established during COVID-19 outbreak as what the poor and those that were not quite Poor, poor, not quite destitute, but obviously struggling. Well, we're going to do this to make their lives easier. At least they're not going to have to worry about food. At least they're not going to have to worry about if they get the sick with this COVID that's going around, this global pandemic. Well, at least we'll have their medical insurance, you know, cost covered for them. They can go to the hospital if they're sick. And if they go to the hospital when they're sick, then, then well, guess what? We can contain them, we can treat them, do what we gotta do, right? You don't want the sick to just stay home because they don't wanna pay the hospital bill. So we'll give them the health insurance. We'll give them food to make sure that they live a healthy life or what they consider to be healthy and what they consider to be enough money to live so that you're not in poverty. And you can break it down by region. You can break it down by nationality, race, creed. But it's all the same. When you boil it down, it's all the same. And why are we talking about this? Well, 
because nobody else is. Here's what the CDC is talking about. More than 2.5 million youth reporting e-cigarette use in 2022. This is what the United States government is wasting their money on. Two and a half million youth reported e-cigarette use. But we're not going to tell you how many of these youth are living in poverty. Why should they? Maybe you're going to make a correlation and go, holy cow. We have twice as many kids that are going without a meal or maybe eating one meal a day. But we're going to focus on the kids that are spoiled rich. Mommy and daddy don't have to ever worry about money. Certainly the kids got an allowance that he can go and buy whatever he wants. And mommy and daddy found him with the vape. So now we need to make a big deal about it. Seriously. Let's, let's expand on this conversation a little bit. Okay. The popularity of e-cigarettes among young people has led many policymakers to restrict the sale of flavored varieties. That's the problem. They love these fruit flavors, this cotton candy. It's attracting the kids, right? That's what we're going to ban them. We're going to ban the flavors and all you're allowed is tobacco flavor. Yuck. Kids aren't going to want that. It's yuck. You know what? Adults aren't going to want it either. And adults are the ones that need to quit smoking. But as you're going to come to find out here pretty soon, most of the people, you would think, when you're talking about poverty, most of the people look like this kid. You know, UNICEF, go feed the children, the hungry children in Africa. What about the hungry children here in the United States? Right? Right? Is the poverty level income enough to support a family? $44,700 for a family of four. We can go on and talking about this for hours. There's so much data out there. How about what are the chronic effects of poverty that is long term? So technically the poverty itself is chronic and generational. Huh? 15.5 million children are living in poverty. But, you know, the CDC is only worried about 2.5 million. That, well, we caught them with a vape, so actually they didn't catch them with a vape. They just happened to mark a check mark on an answer that they did in school one day, not thinking that, you know, even if they lie about it because they want to sound cool to all their other friends that say they're vaping, even though they're probably not. Well... They checkmarked it, so two and a half million kids reported using the vape. But we're not going to talk about how 15.5 million children are living without poverty. And obviously, this is a generational thing, so individuals who experience poverty as a child are more likely to experience poverty as adults as well. Because the whole systemic system is cyclical. Intergenerational issues, well, they get transferred from one generation to the next. If there were issues and dad was in jail his whole life and he had a single mom who was trying to do the best she could for her kids, but obviously can't make enough to feed herself and her kid and work full time and pay for childcare, there just isn't enough money to go around. So you even though you're working 40 hours a week, you're still poor. Even though the government hands you $200 a month or $300 a month to feed your children, you're still going without meals. And the consequences keep being repeated because guess what? Our kids make the same mistakes that we do. Chronic poverty, poverty that persists through two or more successive generations. Why is there even a definition for this? What part of humanity got lost that we no longer care about the sick and the poor? And what's worse, I hinted out about this earlier, the federal poverty line is getting farther and farther from the median family income. 
I talked to you guys earlier today about the census and about how 50% of the people in America make less than $50,000 a year. And you're like, well, $50,000 a year, that, that should be pretty good. Oh yeah, especially if you get mom and dad both out working, make 50 grand, that's 100 grand a year. No, that's not what we're talking about. Take yourself out of your scenario and your situation and put yourself in the situation of a single mom who got a job in his administrative assistant is making $46,000 a year and has got three kids at home. Three kids that have to go to daycare or have to go to activities, well, so that she can work. And obviously, because she's working and the kids are being taken care of by somebody else that you hope is doing a decent job, obviously not as good a job as a parent's going to be able to do for their own. Those kids are without a mom. You think that's not going to have long lasting consequences when they become an adult? They don't have a relationship with their father because he's locked up in jail for whatever reason. And they're living under the roof of a single mom. Or being that this is 2023, it could be the other way around. Mom could be locked up in jail because guess what? You know, she got caught doing drugs and um, she was bartering with the drugs and they threw her in jail. So now you got a single dad that's taking care of three kids, do, making $46,000 a year. And is in the exact same boat. It's not about who's man and who's woman and what's... The fact of the matter remains that these people are struggling. The federal poverty line is getting farther and farther from the median family income. Why does this matter, right? Poverty in the United States, 50 year trend, safety net impacts. How much does the impact health us, right? We can take a look at that. We can look at the breakdown. You can take a look at the percentage. Let's take a look at the economics and how it affects tobacco use. Annual household income and tobacco use. Here's the statistics. If you're living in a family that makes $100,000 or more, there's only a 12% chance that you're going to smoke. When you go between 50 and $99,000, well, that jumps up to 18.4%. And guess what? If you're making between the federal poverty line and $50,000, the number of smokers jumps up to 26.4%. And if you're living right above the poverty line or less, 32.2% of the people smoke and use tobacco products. But yet tobacco control's solution is, we're just gonna tax more cigarettes. Okay. So if you're making $46,000 a year, supporting three kids, right? And you're stressed out 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're not sure how you're gonna be able to keep your job because you hate everybody you work with and you don't like what you're doing at work, but you gotta keep doing it because you gotta support your kids. And you got to go and pay for all this stuff. You're going to smoke because the intrinsic value of a cigarette is in the relief that it gets you. The psychological and the emotional benefits of smoking is something that you can never convey, holistically convey to somebody that has never smoked a day in their life. They don't know. They want to take it and break it down into clinical addiction to nicotine and what are the effects of nicotine. We understand what nicotine does to the body. We understand the psychological impacts that that's going to have and how it's going to biologically and psychologically addict you to be a user for the rest of your life. But they don't take a look and put it into the context of what it's like to struggle every single day of your life. And the only relief that you get is the five minutes you go out and smoke a cigarette or how commonplace it is that that's the crutch you use to emotionally deal with your circumstances in life. You want to know why the poor have the highest smoking rates and why tobacco controls measures are the opposite of what is needed to get these people 
to leave combustible cigarettes alone? They need to have an alternative, safer way to consume the nicotine that they use as a coping mechanism for their life. But you don't hear anybody else talk about that. Truth Initiative is not going to tell you about that. Why are 72% of smokers from lower income communities? Right? What's, what's there's, oh, it's the retailers and the advertising that's to blame. It isn't the fact that these people are suffering. And the only sense of relief that they get is when they light up that cigarette. It's the retailers and it's the marketing and the advertising that's causing these people that have a shitty lot in life to smoke. Discounting and keeping prices low, that's keeping these people smoking. Are you a moron or just a cold, ruthless, heartless bastard? These people have struggles that you could never imagine. And they deal with it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. For 20 years, for each child. You can't imagine. And you're telling me that this is the solution? Drive the prices even higher. Okay. Let's take that same guy, except now this time he's only got one child, right? Technically, he's not living in poverty. He's making $46,000 a year, right? He's got one kid and his old lady's locked up in prison, right? He should be living pretty damn good. Seriously? You think he's living pretty damn good at $46,000 a year? And at $46,000 a year, you're going to be paying like ten grand a year to the, um, the federal government for your taxes? Because you're not in poverty, so you don't get a break. Sorry, buddy. You got to pay your fair share. We're not even gonna get into the disparity between the uber rich and how little they pay in taxes versus the average person making $50,000 a year in the United States and how much they, they actually pay and don't get to write off like the uber rich does. But the story is $46,000 a year, right? This guy struggling, dealing with it. He's going out, he's buying his cigarettes because that's what his coping mechanism is for the life that he leads every single day. And you want to tax it even more. Two packs a day, this guy smokes to deal with this shitty life, right? Two packs a day. Do the math. Let's do the math right now. Because sometimes when you sit there and you go, oh, well, it can't be that bad, really? Sure. All right. $12 a pack times two. $24 every single day right? $24 times 365 days a year, 364. You can take off $25 if you make you feel better. We'll round it down, right? $8,700. We'll round it down. Let's say there were a couple of days that he didn't actually smoke two packs, right? $8,700 a year. So now well, this guy that's making $46,000 a year, $10,000 he had to pay for the government for taxes. Now he just paid another $8,700. Well, guess what? He's now below the federal poverty line. Just paying for his federal income taxes and paying for the taxes on these, these sin taxes for the cigarettes that he uses to cope with life. Well, he's back at the poverty line. No wonder this guy's life is so miserable. And, you, and your solution is for tobacco control to drive the price even more. Well, the guy's feeding his kids, but he probably isn't eating much. He'd rather smoke his meal. But you won't take a look in that aspect of things. You make yourself feel better by driving the price of taxes up. And the government feels better because they're getting all this tax money. Forget about the fact that 0.4% of what they actually get in from tobacco taxes actually goes to tobacco prevention, let alone it actually go to, I don't know, treating the root cause of their smoking, the destitution that they're living in. Yeah, okay. You might say, oh, I'm getting kind of loosey 
loosey goosey with this definition of destitution. And destitution is supposed to be for those that legit don't have a pot to piss in and don't really know where their meal's coming from. But do you think that that person suffers any more than the person that struggles daily and doesn't know how they're going to make all the mortgage payments, how they're going to keep their car? Would you be surprised to find out that six out of 10 Americans couldn't survive a thousand dollar emergency. They wouldn't know where to pull a thousand dollars from if some emergency happened that forced them to cough up an extra grant. Six out of 10 cannot survive a thousand dollar emergency in this country. Do you believe that? Rising inflation and an uncertain economy are deeply affecting the lives of millions of Americans. You're damn right it is. Mental health effects of poverty, hunger, and homelessness on teens and children. It doesn't just affect the teens and the children, it affects the entire family unit, right down to the child. But we're not gonna talk about poverty. We're gonna look down on the poor, we're gonna blame them for you know their lot in life. Heaven forbid that we actually make life better for everybody on here, right? Poverty rates are disproportionately higher amongst non-white populations. Okay, so that makes you feel better because you can break it down and you can identify who's the worst. Why don't you do something to improve the situation? Why don't you face the reality of the problem? You want to know why Richmond, North of Richmond became a number one hit overnight? Take a look at life in Appalachia and realize none of them, not a single one of the people that live in this region or in the deep south or in the border of Texas with Mexico, none of these people reach the level of being able to provide for their family on a comfortable basis. Sure, they're not in poverty, right? They're not impoverished because, well, with a family of four, $26,000, I'm making way more than $26,000. I'm not classified as poor. I got my pride. I've worked 40 hours a week down at the coal mine or down at the mill. I'm bringing in 50 grand a week to feed four and put a roof over their head and drive my beat up old Chevy down the road. And if it breaks down, well, I grab my socket wrench and I'll do whatever it takes to fix the damn thing, keep it on the road. Cause I certainly can't afford a $50,000 pickup. I'm lucky I was able to afford two grand to buy this one and fix her up. That's the reality that we live in and people don't even care. 37.9 million Americans are living in poverty according to the census. But the problem, not could be, the problem is far worse than 37.9 million Americans. And why is it worse? Well, it's not about standing in line for a handout at the church for food because the food stamps that the government gives you ain't enough to actually feed your family. So now you gotta go to food banks on top of you know getting food stamps. It's not about that. It's not about the breakdown of where the poverty is the worst. What states, what locations, what percentage? Here's the Appalachia. Remember I was telling you about down south? It's everywhere. And that's because these people, oh, and then this is the best part I didn't even get to. Child poverty more than doubles a year after hitting record low. Well, it hit record low because I told you during COVID, they, they took it and it was 200% of the poverty limit and they got supplemental assistance. So it brought those people into a normal standard of living. And guess what? Government says, COVID's over, back to 100% poverty. If you make more than that, you don't get any benefits. You don't get any health insurance. Get out there and take an extra job. Well, you're already working two jobs just to afford the bills you got now. Change in employment in the average week, millions of jobs. 
It's so easy when you boil it down into millions of jobs and, well, this 37 million people that are living in poverty, that's just an anomaly. You know, we, we instituted food stamps. We instituted health care for them. But you didn't actually solve the problem. And this is what it boils down to, folks. Poverty in perspective. For a family of three, single parent, two kids in Ohio, the living wage is $54,852 per year. That is more than three times what someone makes on minimum wage, working 40 hours a week. Minimum wage, they say, comes up with $16,952. I'm not sure where they're coming up with that because we did the math, 725 an hour, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. Poverty threshold, they say in Ohio is $20,780. Well, for a family of three, we can take a look at it, but okay, we'll go with your chart. $20,780, they're they're at the poverty threshold. But what does it actually take to survive? We all struggle. I don't care if you're making $75,000 a year, you're still going to have times in your life where you're going to struggle. You get both cars blow up, your air conditioner blew up, your furnace blew up. We all reach emergencies in our life we got to deal with, but we're talking about people that struggle every single day of the week, every single week of the year. How much do you need to make to comfortably be able to afford your mortgage, afford to put food on the table, roof over your head, Electric bills paid, gas bills paid, water bills, sewage, garbage, all the normal essential necessities of life. How much do you have to earn in Ohio for that? $54,852 a year. And you remember at the beginning of the episode how I said 50% of the people in the United States make less than $50,000 a year? Half of the people in this country, regardless of where you live, do not make a living wage. And we can go into the whole $15 minimum an hour raise, you know, minimum salary, minimum wage, but this is beyond that. This is about the fact that government is ignoring the situation and has ignored the situation for a long time. Just like tobacco control, it ignores the reason why people smoke. It's to make themselves feel better. And you think that if you keep driving the taxes up even higher, they're going to stop? The last six decades hasn't taught you that that doesn't work? It's the most effective tobacco control policy out there. Just raise the price of the taxes on it. That'll fix the problem. It didn't work. It's kind of like when you take a look at the immigration problem, right? They say build a wall. Double the budget for immigration control, right? Double the, double the money for the immigration police. That didn't work. Well, double it again. It still didn't work. Just makes the problem worse. You aren't dealing with the root cause of the problem. You'll never get to a successful solution by ignoring the real problem. Half of America is making less than a living wage. You want to know why I brought it up about poverty? And you don't realize A living wage is defined as the minimum income necessary for a worker to meet their basic needs. Just the basic needs. Cost of food, cost of housing, cost of other essentials, and a small margin for unforeseen events. Now that you realize that half the people in this country are making less than a living wage, it's no wonder that six out of 10 couldn't deal with a thousand dollar emergency. It's not a surprise. 
Here's the difference between minimum wage and living wage and why it matters. Well, it's pretty easy to understand. Inflation cools but stays near 40-year high. Well, when is that going to be adjusted for and compensated for? It's not. These people are working as much as they can. Some of them are working two, three jobs, one full-time job and two part-time jobs just to make ends meet. And guess what? They're still making less than a living wage, working three jobs. And guess what? Mom's got a part-time job too in some families. It's not as great as people want you to think it is. But this all boils down to the fact that this has a traumatic effect on children. The psychological effects and the well-being of children, well, you could pretty much use that as a predictor for how well a country is doing. And if you take a look at that over time, you'd be shocked to find out how traumatized our children are. How does the United States compare on child well-being? You're going to love this one. Okay. For home and family environment, job and income, the average disposable household income for children gets a top third ranking. And who's doing this ranking? The OECD. The OECD Child Wellbeing Data Portal Country Fact Sheet. Right? Better policies for better lives. Children in relative income poverty is a big red in the United States. Guess who's doing better? Child relative income poverty rates. You know who's doing better in the United States? Mexico, Canada. The average country is doing better than the United States. Who's doing the best? Denmark. Yeah, I'm not going to go and keep harping on this. We've been talking too much about this whole poverty situation because it's getting to the point now where I, I just can't. I can't ignore it. In 2021, there were 73.6 million children, 0 to 17 years old, living in the United States, and they're worrying about their mental health. What's the number one leading cause of children? Accidents. Number two is assault. Number three is self-harm. These children are committing suicide because of how poor their mental health is because of how poor their family is. And we're not paying attention to it. We're worried about whether they're vaping or not. Not about the fact that, well, at-risk behavior and they're using this to self-medicate. Well, what else is going on in this children's lives? Is there anything else that we can do to intervene to make their life better? Or is this just a fad that they were acting out on? If you make less than $50,000 a year, I guarantee you it's not because they were trying to show off. Current cigarette smoking among adults in the United States by sex, by age, by race, by education by annual household income. About 18 out of every 100 adults smoke because of their low income. Technically, that's not what this says. It says about 18.3% of adults with low income smoke compared to 12.3% with middle income and 6.7% with high income. So if you're well off to do, well, it's easy for you not to smoke. But if you're not so well off to do and you struggle, well, you're more likely to smoke. And from a smoker to the audience out there, I want you to know I enjoyed every minute I smoked because it gave me a sense of relaxation. It gave me an uplift in my mood. And the reason I originally started smoking cigarettes was because I was working the midnight shift 
drank all the coffee I could drink, and guess what? It didn't keep me awake. So I reached for a cigarette and go, well, it's about the only thing I haven't tried. What's the worst that can happen? Well, the worst that can happen is that single cigarette gave me the energy boost I needed, made me feel better about myself. And I smoked every day since then until I found vaping to quit smoking. But it was all about feeling better and getting through the night. There are pleasurable effects to nicotine consumption. And since you're not going to go in and deal with the poverty, how about you make their access to the thing that they use to cope with their lot in life something they can afford and something that isn't going to kill them? That's what makes vaping so good. You reduce the harm. You give them something affordable, which actually gives them more disposable income so that they can eat better and live a better life, and their kids are going to live a better life, and then those kids, when they have kids, are going to have a better lot in life because, well, they weren't struggling as much when they were growing up. I am I the only one out there that thinks optimistically if you focus on the real problems, you might actually end up with a universe that, oh, I don't know, cares about their fellow human being? and wants everybody to live a long, healthy life. And like I said earlier, the United States isn't the only country that has this problem. UK children living in extreme poverty triples in five years. The Tories imposed a two-child benefit cap, deprive families of 3,000 pounds a year, Stammer says, and he won't reverse it. 1.3 billion would alleviate child poverty. Government looking to cut taxes for the rich. Angry. I am too, because that's exactly what's going on here in the United States. The rich have so many tax loopholes and so many things that they can write off. Meanwhile, the poor still has to pay their fair share, even though they're not making a living wage. Half the population in the United States is not making enough to make their ends meet. You're going to love this one. Destitution UK, Jonathan Pye. Coming up in the UK this week, destitution is up. A major study reveals an explosion of extreme poverty in the UK. The study found that as a result of benefit cuts and cost of living pressures, severe material hardship was no longer a rare occurrence. Also, we'll be taking a look at recovery in the city as the UK finally axes its cap on bankers' bonuses. But first, the weather. Welcome to Britain. This is like that time when, as Chancellor, Rishi Sunak cut taxes on champagne on the same day he cut funding to rebuild schools, many of which are now closed because of aerated concrete. Aerated How concrete. How can we help the poorest in our society recover from a... That's just like here in the States, when they have schools that are being closed because, well, they all of a sudden remembered, well, when they built a school, they use asbestos to insulate the plumbing in the building. And, oh, well, they mysteriously forgot about it for decades. And now all of a sudden, well, we got to close this school because it's got asbestos. We need to build you brand new schools where, I don't know, it might actually be safe to send the kids to school. Cost of living crisis? Well, we allow the most bloated, richest, self-serving assholes out there to hoard even more gold. Genius. When Liz Truss was PM, she told us with a straight face that lifting the cap on bankers' bonuses was, and I quote, a key part of their levelling up agenda. Tell a family of four who can't afford childcare, relying on a food bank, how bankers' bonuses stimulates the investment. I dare you. Tell a homeless person that tax breaks for multinationals will help them find a bed tonight. Tell someone that can't afford a fucking shed that the housing market is healthy and stable, striving for a healthy economy whilst millions of people can't afford to eat. It's obscene. We are constantly being told by multi-millionaires that there, there isn't any money. 
that, that you, you need to tighten your belts by a Chancellor with £17 million in his personal bank account. There isn't any money, says Rishi Sunak, who is richer than the King. He is richer than the freeloading arsewipe that resides in Buckingham Palace. True story. They have not one iota of experience of poverty. They have never struggled to feed their kids. Rishi Sunak spends 63 grand a year sending his kids to a private school, which is more than double the median wage for your average UK citizen. See, even in the UK, the median wage is 63,000 pounds, right? Here in the United States, the median wage in the United States is roughly $50,000. I think if you want to get specific about it, which we will, we will actually look at the specific data later, I think it's like $54,587 is the median income. But in most states around the United States, that is still not enough for you to meet your basic essentials of living. A staggering 14 million people are now living in poverty in this country. 14 million people in the UK are living in poverty. And we have 37 million of them here in the United States. And that's using the official method of calculating their poverty levels. That's not looking at a living wage. If you were to take it and look at it as a living wage, Half of the 330 million Americans living in this country are living with less money than they need to meet their essential needs. Seven million households are going without heating. Thousands are being hospitalized with malnutrition. They're being hospitalized in the UK with malnutrition. But meanwhile, if you were here in the United States, guess what? These people do not have health insurance. And if you were to sign up for the Obamacare package, guess what? It only covers 60% of the bloated astronomical prices these hospitals are charging nowadays for health care. Is it really health care that we're getting when we go to the hospital? Or is it, well, this is what we need to do to make sure that we don't get sued for malpractice. So this is what you get. More pharmaceutical products that you don't need because they're not going to treat the underlying problem there either. And, and the government is not helpless to act. It chooses not to. And that's the same here. These 80, 90 year old politicians that have been in office for four decades only worried about one thing. What is it cake to keep them from getting voted out of office? What is the least amount that we need to do to actually help people? Forget about solving the root cause of these problems. Forget about, oh, I don't know, actually adjusting the tax rate so that the, the people that have more money than they'll ever be able to do anything with pay their fair share, while those of us that are living below the median income, which you'll see later on, is actually less than a living wage. Well, I don't know. We might be able to keep our money and actually spend it on feeding our children healthy foods instead of the value meal, nutrient. <sighs> Poverty, hardship, destitution. These aren't just words loony lefties use as political weapons to hit the Tories with because we don't like the Daily Mail. It's a reality. Never in my life have I read a statistic about my country with the words destitution in it. It's Victorian. In a country this wealthy, it is state-sanctioned cruelty. And I guarantee, I guarantee that you are poorer this week than you were last week. And Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are richer this week than they were last week. I guarantee it. It's obscene. And the exact same thing is happening in this country here. And people... They're only worried about, well, I got enough to take care of myself. I'm okay. I don't need to worry about the other people out there because it's up to them. They need to pull their bootstraps up, pick up another job. That's what you do. There's so much funny stuff going on on Facebook right now. Here, here's a perfect Halloween application for you. There's a perfect Halloween outfit for you. Uh, you go as a job application. Nobody will recognize you. Seriously? Most people have two or three freaking jobs and still are struggling to meet their essential needs. Meanwhile, 
we're going to focus on teen vaping, right? Millions of kids don't know when or if they're going to get a meal. If their school closed down because they miraculously all of a sudden remembered these pipes that um, are lining all the plumbing in the schools are lined with asbestos and we got to close the school down and uh, provide temporary school facilities and build you a new school facility because, well, there's actually a class action lawsuit against the school district for knowing that they've had asbestos in the school since the day that it was built and they've ignored the whole problem up until now. Well, we, we, we we're going to... Um, actually deal with the problem now and uh, face reality because it was our predecessors that did it. It's not our fault. Meanwhile, that school's closed. That kid just lost the only meal that they were going to get to eat that day. But it's okay because, you know, we keep everybody focused on teen vaping. We need to eliminate vaping because vaping is the sole problem that we have in our country to worry about, right? Right. Then when you get some people that actually have some common sense and some decency and call out the bullshit to say, you know what? To achieve Biden's cancer moonshot, electronic cigarettes must be widely approved. What a fantastic article. Less smoking means less cancer, especially for black LGBTQ plus Americans. And the poor that we just talked about. This first hour of the podcast. Recently, the Biden administration officials shared a status update on the president's cancer moonshot, one of the most ambitious domestic health policy initiatives in recent memory, inspired by the tragic death of President Joe Biden's son, Bo, from brain cancer at the age of 46. I guarantee you one thing that's not going to be in this cancer moonshot. They're not going to take a look at everything that we've been dumping into our environment that goes into our water supply that each and every single one of us all across the country, regardless of what city you live in, is consuming on a regular basis. When you go to make your pot of coffee in the morning, guess what water you're using? Unless you're one of the rich people in the country that can afford bottled water for everything that's already put in triple osmosis filtered and then minerals are added back into it to give it the taste of water, you're going to be using faucet water. And maybe, maybe you're well enough to do that you actually put it through a filter, you know, a little Brita filter, a little EWT filter that it puts minerals in it and clears, you know, the chlorine and all the other stuff that's in our water. But guess what? People are still coming down with cancer left and right. Because, well, we don't actually deal with the real problems. We make you think that, well, this is bad for you and this is bad for you and this is bad for you. So you have no clue what actually is healthy, and what actually is causing all the disease and death in this country? Because we'd rather focus on things like eliminating vaping and making you think that the processed food is so much healthier for you than the butter or the milk or the eggs. That for generations and generations and hundreds and hundreds of years, our ancestors ate as the primary source of their diet fruits and vegetables during the summer months. and In the winter months, it was canned preserves from the garden they grew in their own backyard. But now, the corporate aristocracy that we have running this country, who's literally patented genetic code of the fruits and vegetables to prevent people from copying their genetic code and copyright infringement of the fruits and vegetables? Well, we're not, we're not going to focus on that. We're not going to focus on what Roundup has done and how much damage that's caused and how many people have cancer. And lymphatic, I don't even know all the diseases that it causes, but you see plenty of lawyers marching around going, come on, I know you got, you got sick and it's Roundup's fault and we're going to go after them and we're going to get all the money. We're going to go after Bayer Pharmaceuticals because of Roundup. Forget about how corporations work and now they just change names and they sell sell off this to that so they don't, they don't have to deal with the liability aspects of it or how corporations will just simply declare bankruptcy and whew, there's no assets for you to get recovery for your disease and your illnesses and your injuries. Biden's cancer moonshot. 
I guarantee you they're going to ignore the root cause of preventable disease in this country. Anyway, that was a good article. If you want to read it, the link's there. Feel free to check it out. And once again, sign up for our newspaper or we're not going to let you read the article. Well, you're going to get the gist of it right there from the title. Altria joins British American Tobacco in voicing warnings about illicit electronic cigarette sales. Yes, Altria and British American Tobacco both committed to a smoke-free generation is now trying to eliminate every single smoke-free product out there that isn't theirs. Because, you know, we have shareholders that expect us to earn a profit. But forget about actually worrying about the disease and illnesses and injuries that their products caused and continue to cause for every pack of combustible tobacco that's sold out on the planet. They know that their future is in electronic cigarette sales. So, well, being that their products suck and taste like crap and don't really work and don't fulfill the needs of people like me that need a direct along open tank system, well, we're going to ban all that stuff and we're going to get the FDA and the CDC and the Justice Department all to go after it and put injunctions in there and customs is going to block every single one of these things from coming into the country because the only products that you should be allowed to buy are the ones that we make, which are also, by the way, made by the same company as the vapes that we buy in the vape stores. Because, well, professional corporation, and uh, here we have the Enjoy Ace. And if you take a close look at that inside there, you'll come to find out that, well, that's my buy, feel them. Parent corporation of Vaporesso is making the Enjoy Ace. So the product works. It's made by a vape company and sold by a big tobacco company. It's been authorized by the FDA for sale in every gas station, convenience store, grocery store that has a tobacco license all around the country. But if you need something that's got more potential than that, and has better flavor than that, or a direct to lung disposable like this one, I'm sorry. We're going to go and sue these people. Like, the, you know, this this masking Apex 6000. Well, no, no, you can't have that. That's not been authorized by the FDA, and it's not made by Altria or Big British American Tobacco or any big tobacco company. It's banned. It's been relished into the bin. Matter of fact, it's getting so ridiculous here. The vape sales banned. Cigarettes $10 in Simona County are under brand new ordinance. Supervisors voted four to one in favor of multiple changes to the county's tobacco retail license ordinance. Simona, some Sonoma County, California, in response to public health data showing the use of e-cigarettes and flavored tobacco products, also known as vapes, is increasing among high school aged youth. The Sonoma County Board of Directors Supervisors voted four to one Tuesday to ban the sales of all these products. No more vaping for you. Forget about the laws they already have on the state books in California, which already show bans don't work. If people want a product, they're going to get the product. And if they can't get it, they're going to make it themselves. But you know, we need to take care of a big farm and a big tobacco buddies and forget about the healthcare industry that's going to profit from all your disease and death from smoking cigarettes your entire life. No, no. We're going to allow the cigarettes to keep being sold. We're not going to touch them. But, you know, vaping, oh, it's banned, relegated to the black market, gone. And now... This whole fear-mongering campaign is now moving into the United Kingdom. Warning over illegal vapes that are laced with spice after students collapse. More fear-mongering campaigns. Which brand was laced with spice? Actually, it's irrelevant which brand was laced with spice because it's a laced product. It is not a legitimate product sold by a corporation and meeting federal regulatory standards or country regulatory standards in the UK. 
doesn't matter. It was contraband, adulterated products. So now we got to keep the fear-mongering campaign going. And Middlesboro Mayor Chris Cookie and Sergeant Daniel Oldroyd from Middlesboro Neighboring Policing Team sit here for a beautiful picture with 25 different brands, at least 25 different brands of disposable and single-use vaping products and tell you that Cleveland police have seized dozens of vapes confiscated by students by a school in Middlesboro in the last few weeks, which are now being tested for Class B substances, spice, and THC. Police said some reusable vape pens are being filled with the drugs by dealers, with officers receiving reports that students had become unwell after using them. Police warned the devices are believed to be sold to young people using Snapchat and other social media platforms. Moving on. Lithuania urged to reconsider flavor ban. The Independent European Vape Alliance has called on Lithuania to reconsider a proposed ban on key e-liquid ingredients, including sweeteners. Of course, because, you know, if we have a product that's been generally accepted and generally recognized as safe, well, we're going to cause more fear and anxiety, and we're going to force people to ban things because, well, that's the only avenue that we have. But do you see anything in Lithuania going on to ban actually combustible tobacco? Of course not. Uh, the country's draft law amending Article 9 slash 2 of law number 1-1143 on the tobacco control of tobacco. Tobacco products and related products proposes a ban on placing on the market e-cigarettes and e-cigarette filters with liquid adapted for filling electronic cigarettes, if this liquid contains sugar and or sweeteners. First off, if they understood anything about vaping, they would know that there is no actual sugar inside of a vape. Because, well, as soon as you puffed on it, that sugar would caramelize on the coil and a vape wouldn't work anymore. However, there are other sweeteners that are used inside of vaping products. So, being that they are easily expressing their ignorance on the topic, they just wanted to cover all things in particular, sugar and or sweeteners. Meanwhile, their addition of sugar into vaping liquid as a banned prohi prohibited substance indicates that they have no idea how this product works. I know I didn't play the bumper today, but I figured with us taking a look at that uh, situation in the UK, I'm trying to make this as short as possible. And I know I'm already over the one hour mark. My goal eventually is to get this podcast down to one hour a week. And maybe once I get off the things that are most prominent on my chest, I'll actually be able to meet that self-imposed deadline of a one-hour podcast. However, here in the United States, vape shops are now being threatened with lawsuits for selling, and I quote, ICE products. Right. A company best known for selling hookah products is sending cease and desist letters to vape shops, threatening to take legal action for selling products that use the name ICE. California-based Fantasia Distribution is also involved in two lawsuits charging several vape manufacturers with infringing on Fantasia's trademark. ICE is now trademarked. So just because these vape companies thought that we're not going to call them cool or cooling because we don't want people to think that we're trying to illegitimately market the product as being cool to jewel or cool as in the brand of cigarettes. Well, we're going to call our cooling sensation that we have in our flavoring agents ice because, well, 
it gives you the perception of having something that is icy inside your liquid. But apparently, even the word ice has now been patented and considered an actual trademark. And anybody that likes the word ice and uses it as a description of their flavor is now in violation of this trademark and subject to a lawsuit. Unbelievable. So what's going to happen if they get all their wishes and they ban all these flavors and they ban these vapes and they blend the disposables? What's going to happen? Is it perhaps the same thing that's happening right now with combustible tobacco? This map shows a black market cigarette sales boom all across the United States because, well, people hate taxes, especially people that are poor and can't afford the cigarettes in the first place, but because it is the only sense of satisfaction that they get to have as their pleasure, it's the only sin that they consume, well, they're going to keep consuming it, even if they have to go without meals. Even if, well, maybe the electric bill is going to be paid a little bit late this month. Maybe the water and the sewage bill is going to be postponed another month. And, well... Since I hear that the state right next to me charges $2 a pack less taxes than they do here, well, I could save up a little bit of money and I could take a drive across the border and buy my cigarettes over there and bring them over here. Matter of fact, I might even take out a brand new credit card and I'm going to go across the state lines and I'm going to buy myself as many cartons of cigarettes over there as I possibly can. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to sell them to all my friends and go, hey man, well, I pay $12 a pack for these cigarettes when I can sell them to you for 10. And by selling them to you for 10, I'm still making a dollar per pack profit that goes to help fund the habit that I have that caused me to even drive across state lines to go get the stuff for myself, let alone my close friends and family. And well, this is so prominent a problem in the United States that we actually have a chart smuggling cigarettes consumed as a percentage of total cigarettes consumed. And granted, you know, this one is dated 2013, but I'm sure you can go and do a Google search and find yourself a more up-to-date list if that's what really floats your boat. But isn't it interesting to know that the states that don't have ridiculous taxes on their cigarettes, well, they're selling a lot of cigarettes. And the states that have extreme taxes on it, like, oh, I don't know, New York, which is ranked number one at 58% are black market cigarettes consumed in their state. Well, I'd be willing to bet there'd be a lot of North Carolina taxes Stamps on the bottom of those cigarettes that are sold inside of New York because people don't want to pay New York's astronomical cigarette taxes if they can buy it somewhere cheaper. Or you could just drive to the Indian nation where technically federal law doesn't apply to the Indian nation. <sighs> when you make laws too restrictive, all you're going to end up with are black markets to fulfill the needs of the consumers that want to purchase these products that have been banned by these greedy politicians. But it's not all a wash. It's not all a loss. Has smoking lost its cool? Total number of cigarettes sold in the United States. Here's a chart that goes from 1980 to 2021. And you can clearly see on here the amount of cigarettes that have been sold has dropped from 628.2 billion cigarettes to 190.2 billion cigarettes in 2021. Is that a realistic number? How much of the black market has not been accounted for in this? If you take a look at it and look at the cigarette taxes over time and overlay that with this chart, well, I guess you're going to find out that as the cigarette taxes go up, the tracked cigarette sales has decreased. Kind of like when you take a look at Japan. When they introduced heat not burn in Japan, well, as 
the sales for heat not burn increased, the percentage of cigarette sales decreased an equal amount. It's almost as if, oh, I don't know, it would be product substitution for the smoker. Like when smokers decide to look at the science themselves and not believe the propaganda and scaremongering stories that are on TV and go, hey, man, that tastes pretty good. And this is supposed to be less harmful for me than lighting cigarettes? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to do this. I'm not going to buy cigarettes again. So sales are going to go down for cigarettes, but sales are going to go up for heat not burn products. Wow. I wonder if there's other studies in other countries that have been done that way. I know for a fact that they have been. I've read numerous studies about it. And maybe that's what we'll talk about next week. Unless something else comes across my desk that fires me up even more. Like this week on how poverty is what drives cigarette smoking. And cigarette taxes and cigarette smuggling by state is this problem that is continuing to get worse. Excessive tax rates on cigarettes in some states induce substantial black and gray market movement of tobacco products into high tax states from low tax states. Or in the case of flavor bans in states that don't have flavor bans into states that do have flavor bans. So even though New York has decided that we're gonna ban flavored vaping, well, guess what? People in New York can still go to any corner store, gas station, maybe even computer shop, and they can buy their flavored vaping products. Even though, well, there aren't any legal sales of vaping products in New York anymore. It's technically all black market sales. So go ahead, keep banning them and keep moving everything to the black market because all you're doing is making it cheaper for the end user to get the products that they want. Well, another topic that we need to bring up, menthol. I'm brought up on how the FDA is finished off its final round of um, feedback to banning menthol products. And it is now in the hands of the Congressional Budget Office to determine if the FDA goes forward with its menthol prohibition in the United States, how much is it gonna cost the federal government because they banned menthol? How much taxes are they gonna lose? And How much more is the government going to have to spend on policing the black market for menthol products? Menthol cigarettes retain cool, but head for illegal status. The current share, according to 2020 from the Federal Trade Commission, is a recent data you can get. But for 2020, menthol cigarettes made up 37% of the cigarette market. So let's say that the FDA gets its wish and actually bans menthol cigarettes in the United States. 37% of the cigarette sales in this country are just gonna poof, magically disappear off of the data because it's now illegal and nobody is gonna legally sell menthol cigarettes in this, in this country. So you're going to get an artificial bump in, oh, look at how many people quit smoking because we banned menthol cigarettes. Actually, you're going to get a short, small percentage of these menthol cigarette smokers that are just going to go and continue buying non-menthol cigarettes in the same location they did because they don't like change. And, well, I have to change because they don't sell my Marlboro menthol gold anymore, so I'm going to have to buy, well, Marlboro Reds this time. So those people that are stuck in their ways are going to buy regular traditional combustible tobacco cigarettes. So it's not going to be a hundred percent conversion, but the rest of these people are either going to stop buying cigarettes from their traditional sources and conversely buy from a new black market source if they can get them, or they may purchase regular tobacco cigarettes and well, 
spray it menthol onto them themselves or try to DIY the little menthol capsules you used to be able to buy. You remember the cigarettes that had those little balls inside that you had to break the ball and it was a traditional cigarette, but because there was that menthol ball inside the filter that you crushed, not to name any names, but you know, just like a camel, it hoarded the menthol until it was time for it to be released and you crushed it and well, you got your menthol cigarette, even though it wasn't a menthol cigarette. These things are going to become commonplace. All you're doing is making more things illegal and more criminals because we don't have enough criminals in the justice system already. We haven't incarcerated a high enough percentage of people in this country. New York City bans tobacco sales to people under the age of 21. This is from 2013. They went and took it to the next level. And look at the look at the price of cigarettes. 1350 a pack. This is from 2013, November 19th of 2013. How much is a pack of cigarettes in New York now? And you wonder why 58% of the cigarettes that are consumed in the state of New York aren't bought from the state of New York? You can go to a neighboring state and buy a pack for 10. Quebec's new vaping regulations start next week. Listen, I wanted to bring this up because it's an inevitability, right? I, I've, I've reported it. They announced the change. They announced the fact that these new regulations are going to be coming into play. And, well, bye-bye flavors in Quebec. New regulations come into effect next week to ban flavored vaping products from being sold in Quebec. But people who buy these products say that they're going to buy them online instead. Starting on October 31st, all flavored vaping liquids, except tobacco flavor, will no longer be sold in Quebec. Hmm. Boy, that's almost like the conversation we just had about New York and their cigarette taxes. They keep jacking up the prices and they ban flavored products. But guess what? In the United States, when they ban menthol cigarettes, People are still going to smoke menthol cigarettes. They're just going to find a different way to get what they want because the laws don't actually fix the problem. They only make new problems and make existing problems worse. Anyway, it's a problem of a black market for combustible tobacco products is universal all around the world. And you know who's fighting it? Who wants the fight the most? Well, tobacco companies, they're, they're going to want you to think, hey, man, we're losing profit because we're, we got these black market sales. Black market sales isn't really black market. It's made by legitimate companies, but it's just not being taxed appropriately or it didn't go through their official chain. Just like black market vapes aren't actually made by Jimmy Bob in his garage. They're legit products sold in a different country and imported illegally crossing the border because it doesn't comply with local laws. Here in Australia, under the counter deals, chop, chop, and arson attacks inside Victoria's illegal tobacco market. Uh-huh. When you're charging $50 for a pack of smokes, a pack of fags, a pack of durries, people aren't going to want to pay $50 a pack. And well... At $50 a pack, you're giving a heck of a lot of motivation to the criminal organizations to produce these products for the consumers that still want to buy them but don't want to pay $50 a pack. So that means you got to go to a neighboring country where you can pick them up for, oh, I don't know, a buck and a half a pack. And even with your transportation costs and your potential liability for getting caught and importing those products illegally into Australia, they're still going to make a crap ton of money and sell them for half the price that you would pay for them legitimately inside of a store. And you're going to have a massive black market supply. What do you have for 20 bucks? Well, I can get you a pack of this branded cigarette. Let me pull it out from underneath the counter and sell it to you because I know you certainly don't want to pay what the state wants you to pay for a pack of cigarettes. Perhaps the solution to this problem isn't 
oh, I don't know, more taxes that only worsen the poverty situation all around the globe. Perhaps the problem isn't banning them to create all these black markets. Perhaps the simplest and easiest solution of all would be, oh, I don't know, a legit regulated market where cheap products are sold and where combustible products are taxed to make them less attractive than the most attractive product. Because realistically, once a smoker tries a tobacco harm reduction product, the chances of them ever lighting up another cigarette decreases as time goes on. The products have gotten so good, I can't think of a single reason why a smoker wouldn't want to switch. Except for all these bans and except for all these taxes and the confusion and the scaremongering that goes on. Illicit tobacco trade helps. Really? The tobacco industry, while tobacco companies publicly condemn illicit trade, evidence suggests they have embraced it as a way to get and keep people addicted, enter new markets, and partner with governments and agencies to fight against control tobacco control measures. You know what? Why aren't we going to face reality? These are for-profit corporations that have stockholders that they have to meet their obvious fiduciary duty to supply a profitable venture for their investment in the stock. So the fact is there isn't Jimmy Bob growing tobacco in his back garden on about 40 acres and processing that to sell Chop Chop in Australia. That's just not how it works. You're buying it from a legitimate tobacco company through illegitimate channels. That is the only thing that's going on here. And instead of worrying about tobacco tax revenue and lost taxes globally that you're not spending on tobacco control anyway, maybe we just need to focus on a legitimate, safer alternative option for smokers out there. Menthol cigarettes. The wrong move to make. Breaking news. As a person with a vested stake in the upliftment and empowerment of the black community and a history of working closely with the youth, I feel an obligation to address the proposed FDA menthol ban and its potential negative impacts on our community. While public health concerns regarding menthol cigarettes are valid, the ban's unintended consequences cannot be overlooked, especially concerning its disproportionate effects on black Americans. Listen, he's not the first person to come up and stand up and say, listen, all you're doing is going to create more criminals. When you ban these products, you're not actually going to stop people from consuming them that want to consume them. They will find a source for doing that. And when they do that, they're breaking the law, which means all you're doing is making the criminal justice problem on the black community even worse. Sorry, folks. I'm very passionate about this because it's just common sense. Why can't people look at the picture, find the facts, and make an informed decision for themselves? No, they'd rather face hypocrisy and accept it in its lies and its exaggerations, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah, sure. Teen vaping. Oh, that's a problem. We got to deal with it. What are we going to do? We're going to ban it. Does it actually fix a problem? No. Were the kids purchasing them legally from a supply store that legally sells them to adults? No, not directly. Somebody bought them from a legit source and then sold them in an illicit channel. It's the exact same thing that happens on a national scale or in the United States from state to state when you're talking about, oh, black market cigarettes. It's the same Marlboros. They just have a different tax stamp on them. And that's the tax stamp that makes it illegal. Vaping news. What a sad subject to try and search for and find factual information. But you will find them doing scaremongering stories and telling you increasing 
um, increases in the number of brands and the sales of disposable devices and flavors are popular among youth. Okay. Well, if the entire market is indicative, indicative of legitimate sources and legitimate purchasers and legitimate buyers, and the adults are the ones that love the flavors, since that makes up the majority of the market, being realistic, some of those people that are of age, 22, 23 year old, are going to be opening up shop to sell vapes to underage people. But when you catch the underage people vaping and you look at the inventory of what they turned in, it's going to be reflective of what's out on the market and what the adults love. Because I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I liked certain things. And guess what? As an adult, I still like the same things, especially around Halloween time. Anyway, well, question, how many people are employed in the field of tobacco control? The point of this exercise is to learn how many people would be unemployed if every smoker suddenly stopped smoking tomorrow. Oh, what an interesting thought. How can we estimate this? Well, first, let's figure out exactly how much money pours into the tobacco control field. Then we can plug an average salary and do some simple division. Trigger warning for everybody who thinks on a global scale. You may be shocked by how much the United States is the gorilla in all of this. Impact of the U.S. 1998 Master Settlement Agreement at CDC Tobacco Free Budget is $712 million, plus $100 million from the Truth Initiative's endowment. And we also have the philanthropy of Michael Bloomberg to give us a total of $972 million set for tobacco control in the United States. Meanwhile, we have over 47 million people in the United States living in poverty. 15 million children that cannot guarantee a meal if they don't go to school. But sure, let's allocate almost a billion dollars for tobacco control. You might notice the 972 million ignores other countries. Tobacco control is such a low priority in most countries that we might be justified in ignoring them. But I know something most people don't. A recent NIH study shows that the U.S. funds 85% of all tobacco control research on earth. And you can see how crude all this is. But let's use 85% as the fudge factor, okay? So if $972 million per year equals 85% of all tobacco control spending globally, then the total global spending on all tobacco control activities would be about $1.14 billion a year. And I'm guessing that's an undercount, uh, but we can be conservative about this, okay? So $1.14 billion per year, total global spend on tobacco control. So how much does the average worker in this subfield of public health make? I have no idea. As I keep saying, this is a back of the envelope kind of deal. But notice, if we assume high salaries, that means far fewer employees. How much do you make? and the thumbnail for this week's episode, but in a different context. My question about how much do you make is to put you into somebody else's shoes because half of all Americans make less than $50,000 a year. 60% of Americans live with less money than a living wage in this country. However, getting back to Dr. Charles Gardner, if 85% of all people employed in the tobacco control field live in the United States, what would the average salary be? Well, the simple way is to look at $59,428. Way too exact for what we're doing here. Many tobacco control workers are professionals. The average U.S. professional salary is $140,000 a year. So X plus Y divided by two uh, comes up with an average in the U.S. average annual salary 
and the average U.S. professional salary, super easy. We talked about that, $100,000 a year. So now toss in low and middle income countries where the tobacco control workers and everyone else in the country make way, way less. And I'm not sure what to do with that. If we had the whole world plus the U.S. gorilla, the average salary might work out to be 50 or 60 or $70,000. Who knows? But let's just stay conservative here. Let's call it, um, I don't know, maybe $85,000 a year, which is above the living wage in the United States. In most of the states, can you guess which ones haven't been? Oh, I'm going to give you the list of all 50 states at the end of this podcast. However, global spending on tobacco control globally is $1.14 billion a year. Think of how many homeless people could use some of that money to put a roof over their head or a warm meal in their belly. And the average salary in the field is $85,000 a year. Finally, we come with a simple math of 13,411 people would be out of work if everybody on the planet quit smoking combustible tobacco and tobacco control had nothing to do. So that's it. If every smoker on earth quit tomorrow, about 13,400 people would lose their jobs. And this would affect their families too. Assuming an average family size of four times 13.4K equals $53,600. So roughly the number of protesters in Tahir, scare, Tahir Square during Egypt's 2011 revolution is how many people would lose their job. And if every smoker quit tomorrow, this would harm 44,000 Americans who's our breadwinners working at the FDA tobacco, CDC tobacco free, Bloomberg.org, Truth Initiative, American Cancer, the Lung Association, American Heart Association, state health departments focused on tobacco and the research universities dumping the scientific studies out there funded by all of this money. Fantastic, isn't it? Isn't it truly fantastic? The potential impact of eliminating illicit trade in cigarettes, a demand side perspective. Illicit cigarettes account on average for 11.2% of the market in the 36 countries studied. The elimination of illicit cigarettes would reduce total cigarette consumption by 1.9% across these countries. Because they know. Just because you eliminate something doesn't mean it solves the problem. You need to look at the underlying issues on what's causing it. And don't blink an eye when British American Tobacco and Altria and Philip Morris International and Japan Tobacco and China Tobacco are all out there trying to eliminate the black market products because tobacco involves criminal gangs and smuggling across borders and engaging with large scale tax evasion. Ignore the cancer, the heart disease, the stroke, the emphysema, all the money that big pharma is making selling products for all of the people who got sick from combustible tobacco. Ignore the fact that there is a scientifically proven product available where people could make a product substitution and not die and get sick from tobacco-related mortality and diseases. No, we're not going to pay attention to that. Just like we are not going to pay attention to housing and food needs. No, we're not going to pay attention to that. What are we going to pay attention to? the things that hit our pocketbook. Milk prices by year and adjusted for inflation. 1995, a gallon of milk is $2.50, and now it is close to 4 or $5, depending on where you live. That is affecting people's livelihood. How about the cost of electricity? You know, 
back when we were kids, electric bill was, here's a 20, right? We didn't have any of these high energy efficient LED light bulbs back then. We were burning big, massive incandescent light bulbs. A 60 watt bulb is 60 watts. A 150 watt bulb is 150 watts. Not like it is now. A 100 watt bulb is nine watts. But we're still paying double, triple, quadruple, or more than what electricity used to cost even just 10 years ago. Residential per kilowatt hours just keep going up. 2013 residential average was $12.13. Now it's $15.04. It's the average price of electricity to customers of one utility company. And every single electric company out there has the same increases over time. The living wage for a single person in every state is two, three, or four times what the federal government says classifies you as being in poverty. Forget about destitution. Whether you've shopped for groceries, gas, or even a car in the past, you know that gas prices and all prices have raised significantly in the past couple of years. Inflation is astronomically high. Meanwhile, supp supplemental nutrition programs are being cut. Health insurance, Medicaid coverage is being cut. Even for the elderly that have been on it for a decade, they didn't fill out their paperwork properly, so we need to pull their health insurance and their food stamps. No more visiting nurse for you and hope your church has meals on wheels that doesn't care about whether you qualify for food stamps to bring you your meals every day. What states require the most money for living wage? Since housing and other necessities make up 50% of the living wage, it stands to reason that states with higher housing costs require more money to earn a living wage, such as Hawaii or Massachusetts or California or New York or Alaska or Maryland. States requiring the least amount of money to earn a living wage have the lowest rates, such as Mississippi, Oklahoma, Alabama, Arkansas, Kentucky. So what are the living wages in all 50 states? Mississippi, 45,900, Oklahoma, 46,000, Alabama, 46,500, Kentucky, 47,300, Kansas, 47,300, West Virginia, 47,700, Missouri, 47,700, Iowa, 48,000, Tennessee, 48,000, Nebraska, 49,000, Georgia, 49,000, Illinois, 49,000, Wyoming, 49,000, Indiana, 49,000. Michigan, Louisiana, Ohio, Texas, $50,000. New Mexico and Minnesota, $51,000. South Dakota, South Carolina, North Dakota, $52,000. Wisconsin, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, $53,000. Utah, $55,000. Delaware, $56,000. Montana, fifty-seven. dollars Florida, fifty-seven. dollars Virginia, fifty-seven. dollars $58,000 for Nevada, Idaho, and Colorado comes up to $59,000. Rhode Island is $59,000. And $60,000 for Arizona and Maine. $62,000 for New Hampshire, although $62,935 is just as good as Connecticut at $63,000. New Jersey, $64,000. Washington State. 65,000 with Oregon and Vermont. Maryland's at 67,000. Alaska is almost $72,000 a year for a living wage. New York is 73,000. California is 80,000. Massachusetts is 89,000. And Hawaii tops the list with $112,411. To earn a living wage to meet your basic needs. Meanwhile, our government and the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement is funding campaigns like this. Why be happy when you can be sad with a depression stick? 
That's what we need to focus on, not what's actually causing children's mental health to be in crisis. Forget about the poverty. Forget about that. Focus on the fact that, well, the depression stick is is what's making their depression worse. How about you quit being so ignorant and actually pay attention to the real problem? The fact that half of this country isn't earning a living wage. Half of that is living in poverty. They don't know when they're going to get their next meal. They don't know if they're going to be able to keep putting a roof over their head. They're turning off their heat until it's literally freezing in the house. This is not about having air conditioning in the summertime. This is about you having the basic need to survive a meal in your belly and a roof over your head. You want to eliminate combustion and disease and death in this country? Stop wasting money on anti-vaping campaigns and put the money in the mouths of the people that don't have a meal to eat tonight. And that wraps up this episode of Facing Hypocrisy. I'll be back next week with another episode. My wish to all of you is peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. I hope you guys have a fantastic week ahead. And I'll be back with another topic next week. If you have any suggestions, comments, please leave them below. And I'll be happy to answer them on our next week's episode. So this is Facing Hypocrisy, episode two. Hope you guys have a fantastic day. I'll catch you next week.